Okay. Still connecting to audio. Got it. Okay. And oh, there you are. Okay. A little bit of a delay. All yeah. Right, Matt, thanks for joining me. And um, you know, I'm excited to chat with you about all the latest developments here in uh, Los Alamitos with uh, what well, shocking, shocking uh, statement by uh, one of the board of trustees. And uh, let's just give everyone a background first. So, you know, while, while you connect your audio and everything, uh, Matt and I uh, first met at one of the Los Alamitos, uh, um, basically our protests against the critical race theory that was being implemented in the schools. And Los Al was one of the first to have some sort of um, uh, implementation without any approval from the actual board. And, you know, this stuff was getting taught and in o o Oak Middle School, someone came home with a Huffington Post assignment to write about uh, why they're a racist. And this is the type of stuff that incensed a lot of parents, including regular everyday parent, Matt Simmons here, who's with us today. So Matt, you wanna tell us in your own words, what was the spark and what got you first involved before we kind of catch up to the latest events? Well, you know, I've been following critical race theory on Twitter for some time. And so I always thought of something that took place far away. And it was really shocking to see it come home to Los Alamitos. It was also shocking to see how informed a lot of parents are. Because I think a lot of parents know that this is bad stuff. It's divisive. It's harmful. It makes us the divided states of America instead of united. And, and I... See, and then I started going to the board meeting, speaking out against it because I had no idea it was coming here until I got noticed on my door saying, hey, it's here. And, and that they were doing these. And at first we thought it's just one class. So I started attending the board meetings because I think this is so important to protect our children. And, and then I saw that this was top, basically top down. The, the, they, they, they're, they introduced a framework and then it, this is before it hit me personally, it hit my eight, nine year old son at the time he's eight. But just to kind of take a step back, this was, they're doing a framework at Los Alamitos Unified School District instead of a curriculum. So then that way, this framework is totally racist. It's totally critical race theory, no matter what they call it, they change the name every week. And, and then in kindergarten, they want kindergartners to be identifying themselves by their identity and what is that? And they're going to be turning race into a thing instead of just focusing on being kindergartners and getting along and focuses on, like, they're just now focused on the differences. And a lot of times that just makes things worse. You should be focused on what brings us together. And then by 12th grade, according to this framework, uh, by 12th grade, according to Dr. Pulver, who introduced this publicly at board meetings, 12th graders will be required or, you know, to not only stand up against biased actions, whatever that means, but they need to stand up against biased thoughts. Now, what is a biased thought? Does that mean somebody's conservative and they have a whole framework that's, you know, something they don't agree with? So now, and how do you see a biased thought? How do you identify a biased thought? I mean, this goes into some crazy gulag stuff where it's like, now you have to justify your thoughts and defend your thoughts. I mean, this is insane. And, that, and now these students not only are empowered, but are it's part of their constitution now to stand up or their framework to stand up against what they perceive as biased thoughts, which could be anybody who they disagree with. It's and, highly subjective. It's, very, um, and, you know, Matt, I really do, do want to, uh, first of all, I got two very important questions before you continue, because you're throwing me so much great stuff. But first of all, that notice that you got in your door that you said, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what uh, that notice said? And that I guess it was the, the aha or light bulb moment that it has arrived very officially. Tell us a little bit about that note first. Yeah, it was a call to action, and I'm not sure who left it, you know, on my door, and I'm very thankful they did. I think for it to arrive on my door, that means there are people who are concerned, who there's a lot of footwork to make that happen, um, mm -hmm. and I appreciate everybody's efforts. You know, some people knock it, but this is freedom of speech and stuff people should know about, mm -hmm. and I would not have known about it if it wasn't, if somebody didn't take the time to canvas the neighborhood. So thank you, whoever did that. Um, mm -hmm. That notice was talking about critical race theory at Los Alamitos is talking about how there's these 
um, I guess different speakers. If I, it's been a while, but I believe they they mm -hmm. brought in Los Alamitos has spent I believe hundreds of thousands of dollars to these quote uh, speakers to institute this critical race theory and subject. It's a combination of tra of a uh, courses and and so. Mm -hmm. I forget the exact message in the in the in that letter, but there was, it was a message it, promoting critical race theory. Am I correct? No, oh, no. This was a a message saying to stand up against it. Against it, that, it okay. Was unified so that was probably our town hall that I spoke at. And, yes, uh, yes, it was exactly. Okay. Yeah, in Long Beach. Yes. Yeah, and that that really made a transformative difference because I, I may not have even got wind, you know, and and people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who went there saw that their other parents just like themselves that they could identify with and and then they and you know who were the biggest the most influential speakers at that event were actually I think Chinese and Vietnamese speakers whose families fled their countries and came to America and they value freedom and I this one Chinese uh, lady said to me she goes if you don't stand why where are all the other parents because there there were a lot of people there but there should be more. And I don't think this is popular stuff. And she goes, and, and I told her, I think people are scared. They don't want to be, you know, people do not want to stand up or stand out. And she goes, well, if they're scared to speak out now, it's going to be worse in the future. You have the freedom to speak out. You need to speak out or you're going to lose your freedom to speak out. And, you know, I still think about her all the time because she's an inspiration. That's wonderful. And then do you, did, did you attend, you attended that town hall or? Yes, I did. And I, um, okay. and, and it's just so beautiful just hearing all those different speakers. And then the shocking part is then Dr. Pulver just categorized all these intelligent, well thought out, educated mm -hmm. speakers from all different backgrounds and ethnicities. And he just wrote us off as right wing extremists. And following that meeting, then they stopped having meetings in person because I think too mm -hmm. many people showed up. They got scared. They turned it into a community threat. They said, oh, we're scared to show up because, you know, the violent extremists. That, that's so not true. If anybody was there, mm -hmm. they know it's peaceful. I mean, you're there, you're speaking there. I mean, it was just people communicating, expressing their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the lengths that uh, Pulver, as well as the media, went to vilify parents like you, I think it kind of disenfranchises your voice by painting you with a broad stroke and actually, you know, ignoring your concerns. But I guess uh, the point of the article that I'm going to write up is really going to focus on uh, the personal experiences that you cannot deny because what they love to do is say, oh, all right wingers are this or, you know, um, that's the problem with our reporting and our media today. It's like the people on the ground level get lost because they get lumped in. Their stories get lumped in with one side. And when you have that division, you don't hear it. And if something legitimate is happening on the left, the right wingers do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have been, you know, doing a series of articles uh, really for uh, Washington Examiner and lots of other publications. Hollywood Times is my local uh, uh, you know, where I, my outlet, where I uh, disseminate a lot of my stories. Uh, you know, one of them is in Hollywood, there's, um, you know, the business owner that couldn't open up his business because the homeless had set up encampments in front of his, uh, he operates a parking lot garage, you know, those ones where you park and pay. He couldn't open that up because the homeless were blocking the, the, the driveway in for six weeks. And the sit, uh, almost two months where the city was no help and they just kept throwing his case around like a football, like, oh, hot potato, I, I, I can't do anything. Right. Talk to the city councilman. City councilman says, talk to the chamber of commerce. I mean, it was ridiculous. So that's the type of uh, you know story that got lost and I'm glad I was able to shine a light on it. And I plan to do the same here with you, Matt, because you are a father in the Los Alamitos school district that has looked at both sides, has looked at, you know, um, as a parent, as a constituent in that district, you have seen, because you have an eighth, eight, eight year old, right? Nine year old now. Nine year old uh, son, son 12 year old daughter. Is, yeah. yeah. So um, could you uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what assignments now that you're, you're, you're helicoptering now because uh -huh. uh, you got alerted, what have you seen come out? I know you had mentioned that they were talking about some of this transgender stuff in um, 
in you know the uh the kindergarten and all of that but in i'm assuming your child is in what second or third grade yeah so my yeah son is now in fourth grade but fourth. beforehand he, when he was in third grade he received a very questionable assignment and the, the assignment was about school uniforms and opinion piece. And this is from actually a major mm-hmm. magazine that I think is, um, you know, I don't want to say it without being 100% accurate. So, but it was from like a major publisher. And, and, so, and, and so there's an optional piece that the teacher included with it. And in this, it talked about the pros and cons. So, okay, pros and cons, should schools have school uniforms? And then it said some ideas as far as why there are cons, and that is uniforms are sexist. Now, why is that? And then I, I, my son was having trouble, not trouble, but I was working with him on the assignment and I had to explain to him what sexist is. And then I realized, oh my gosh, he had no idea what the word sexist is. And here I am as dad edu- educating or indoctrinating my child about sexism. And now- right like I whittled away at his innocence and I'm like, how did this happen? And, you know, I'm just, I was just, you know, you don't, it, word he doesn't know, you want to explain it. And it just wasn't appropriate for his age in third grade at eight years old at the time. And mm-hmm. then the article continued because I was incensed and it starts talking about, well, one of the reasons why it's sexist is what if the school is requiring somebody to wear, wear a skirt because it's a school uniform and somebody's uh, gender, somebody identifies with a gender different than the one that they're born with. So that's a crazy concept to explain to a third year, third grader. And so then I had to explain about gender, like he goes, well, you know, now it gets into what's a boy and what's a girl. And he goes, well, he's so confused because he thought he had a pretty clear idea as far as what's a boy and what's a girl. And then I'm explaining these crazy concepts to him like, hey, this is what I, not what I believe, but it's what other people do. And, and again, I just wish I didn't even have that conversation. I should have just stopped. And but I was kind of in, you mm-hmm. know, I wasn't prepared. I was just, you know, and I just felt so wrong. And then all these other parents had no idea that their child was working on this assignment because everybody's busy and they're, I guess, right. they do their homework on their own, you know, which should be all right, but maybe not anymore. And this doesn't just end in third grade. In sixth grade over at Oak Middle School in the Los Alamos School District, and I'm sure McAuliffe, there are a lot of teachers who are introducing gender pronouns, and this stuff is crazy. Um, so they, one teacher spent an, uh, you know, and the, pardon me, here, let me tell you my hesitation. My daughter still has this teacher as a teacher. There's so much intimidation for me to even tell the story right now, because will she face retribution? Right. So, and a lot of parents are in the same boat. So, but I I think if we're silent, we have to shine the light at this. That's the only way out. And otherwise it just happens. So teachers spent the entire class talking about bullying and, and he- About what? I'm sorry? Bullying. Bullying. Okay. Yeah. Like, because it's a hot topic. Nobody wants to get bullied. Right. So he goes, what is a hurtful thing somebody would say to you? And so, and somebody said something. So I wrote it up on the board and one person over, you know, the next person and whatever the people said, like you suck or whatever it is, the next person would go ahead and write, then he'd write it up on the board. He was actually reward in a shocking, right? He created a crazy feedback loop. And, and so, and and then you've got uh, in other classes, my daughter said that they wrote, people said cuss words which is no surprise. And this is again, secondhand information, but this is what she heard from another student um, that he wrote the cuss words up on the whiteboard. So, and you could imagine the feedback loop, like, hey, we could get the teacher right, whatever he wants. So now he goes, these are all horrible things to say to you. Now, what about your, and then he segued into gender pronouns. And what if somebody referred to you by the wrong gender? So the entire mm. class was like a funnel that started off with saying the worst things on earth and then funneling it right down to the bottom of what if somebody misidentifies your gender pronoun? And then he goes, what do you want your teachers to refer to you by? What do you want your friends to refer to you by? And keep in mind, these are seventh graders who are already going through a lot of confusion. And they were, many of them were just totally caught off guard. And, and then 
they and and so they're caught off guard and so most people just went with their regular gender but a few days later i knew what was going to happen i told my daughter what's going to happen because it's so predictable the mm -hmm. teacher was handing these kids an enormous amount of power because now they could it's like the twilight zone off to the cornfield where the boy could make anybody disappear and they could never come back once they disappear so if any kid now has so much power they could tell a teacher i'm now she i'm now he i'm now a they right. and and if the teacher refuses to go by their gender pronoun what's going to happen to that teacher what's going to happen to that fellow student and it only and these kids are starving for attention and they could just change so now these kids are changing their pronoun a lot of kids are changing their pronouns on a daily basis like it's a game i mean their brains are mush wow. right now i i want to uh, dive into that. I mean, you 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 made the the best comment about the power differential, or now this this little golden goose now that they can use to manipulate adults. Now, what is um oh, are are kids actually doing that? Switching their pronouns on a regular basis? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And your daughter is in which grade? Uh, six. Percent. Yeah, so she's she's in seventh grade. Yeah, seventh. I, I just yeah, because I know I'm at that age, a just lot because... of interests change all the time. So that is a real yeah, and that's where you know I remember seventh grade was when I got sex ed and all of that. So um, at that age, um, these kids are smart enough now to manipulate, is what oh, I'm right, hearing. Right, they know. Yeah, so tell me more about that. Let's dig 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 in on this. Well, I think some kids, you know, they're turning. You know, they're. I, I heard. And again, this is all secondhand. I don't go to seventh grade anymore. Um, so <laughs> that's one kid refers to himself as TV. And, you know, that's his pronoun. So he's kind of pl just playing around with it. But we saw what happened, Gina Carano from Disney, when she said, what's your preferred gender pronoun? She goes, beep, bop, beep, like as if she's a robot. And she got canceled. I mean, she had to go on an apology tour. And wow. eventually she got canceled from Disney. So yeah, you maybe in seventh grade, you could kind of make fun of this whole thing. But there are a lot, a lot of kids legitimately changing their pronoun at their own whim. And that really messes up your brain. Because if you're a man or a boy or a woman or a girl, and that's your gender, I mean, we're not even questioning it. And, and then suddenly they, they're they introducing this whole term of gender fluidity. And, you know, and for most mm -hmm. of the population, it doesn't exist, but it will. They're going to really mess up the wiring of these children's brain as they're developing. Mm -hmm. Society as well. We have uh, pa the first passport issued with a gender X now. <laughs> so my first thought was, you know, um, I have no issue with what people identify as and all of that. You know, there, there's no hatred at all. I mean, I think that's where the left may sometimes try to paint us as hateful people, us everyday people. But the issue is more a safety issue because once you identify as X and you can change your gender and what you identify and that becomes fluid, this is an opportunity for a lot of criminals to start, you know, muddying up their own identity and then getting away with things. So there's, that is a concern on my end. There's a lot of downriver concern and, right. and it, it's none of it is good. And, and I think this is all... I think a bunch of academics came up with this game. I think my belief is it came out in, at the universities and it's down river culture. I was on a board of directors with, there are just 15 people. We knew each other really well and new president comes on board and then he goes, okay, I want everybody to write a bio and put in your gender pronoun. And it's like, we all know each other. We've been on the same board for five years. Like, is there something we need, you know, and if somebody identifies as a her, like it, there's no problem. Like, but there, it, it just shows it's just a cultural thing that they're, and if you're against it, you're anti-trans, you're anti this, you're anti that. And they're creating an issue where there's not. If somebody is a she right. or he, there's no problem. But do mm -hmm. we, all, and now the latest thing is that I see on Twitter and following all this woke culture is they're even getting mad. This whole group of people, um, who may not even be trans themselves, but just just people who are just adopting this 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 culture of wokeism, they're now getting mad at cisgender people, which is if you identify with the same gender as you're born with, they're getting mm -hmm. mad at cisgender people identifying their pronoun because it's it's it, they have their own reasons, but it's all crazy. It's, so it's like you're crazy if you do, you're crazy if you don't. You know, if you're <laughs> against it, 
they're they're doing this gender pronoun, then they're mad that you're um, now you're being hurtful to the you're making the trans people not feel welcome. But then if mm -hmm. you're for it, they now have another reason to get mad. There's no mm -hmm. making these woke people happy, and and like, it's what, perpetual victimhood. Perpetual, and and the school should be focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Right. And let's let's get to that. Do you think that with both your son and your daughter that uh, valuable class time is uh, being sacrificed for um, emotional therapy sessions and uh, premature conversations, like you said, um, about, you know, these issues before, uh, you know, at the expense of, you know, um, and then and, and at the expense of true learning on other subjects? And if so, what what percentage of time do you think um, that is? Because I, I feel like um, that is, uh, you know, the opponents to uh, what we're talking about today would like to say, oh, it's just one elective for ethnic studies curriculum, or it's just one, cla one class day where we talk about this. It's not like we do this all the time. Um, what would you say to that pushback? It is taking up a lot of time. And I think a lot of parents were shocked when they saw the, when school went on Zoom because they saw what was happening and how much time was taken. I know after George Floyd case at one of the school classes in a math class in La Salle or at, in the middle school, the teacher spent the whole time on Floyd and how racist America was. And this is, everybody's already falling behind in coursework. And so we have less time than ever before. There are more minimum days than ever before. And this isn't just one elective class. This is the entire curriculum. This is the entire framework of the curriculum. And it's, and it's also an ongoing thing. This is almost like a constitution, like a, you know, rules to live by that they want to ingrain upon our children. This right. is not like, hey, you learn this lesson in grammar and then we move on. This is like forever. This is every part of the education and, and it colors and prism, like even socially who these, they're turning, um, I, I mean, it, it's like a whole cultural thing that they're pushing upon these children. I don't know why, like, I'm glad there's, um, and look, I'm self-censoring right now. I'm hesitating uh, because I don't want to be marked as a, you know, I know people will watch it and turn things around, but it's, I just don't understand the over-focus on sexualization of these children and what their gender identity and who they love, whether it's a man mm -hmm. or woman. It, like, I don't know why this is a central focus of these schools. And there's a, I heard a, I, you know, the, the, there's a, I was at one of the meetings and I forget the exact details of the story, but somebody was saying like, now's the time, like teacher was almost encouraging these children to like come out, like now's the time. So I, yeah, I wish I knew the details on that, but I was just floored, you know, it's like mm -hmm. now, you know, if you're thinking about this now, and it's like, why do you want everybody, like, why do you need kids to make a con like, I, I just don't understand this. The schools don't need to be involved in these children's sexual lives. Yeah, absolutely. And that it, it's very inappropriate. I mean, there's that viral video or viral post on Facebook that just uh, with this high school and some of the, the kids are dressed, uh, the girls were dressed in Hooters outfits and the guys were dressed in drag and giving lap dances to their principals. What is going on now with this? Um, that is ridiculous. It's not funny either. Right, right. I, yeah, it, it's just crass. And I think it's, it's anti God, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I feel there's, and I don't know what the, the purpose of, of this is, I, I really don't. And I, and a lot of conservative parents are because we, we don't have much choice. I mean, it costs a lot of money to send your kids to private schools. And pretty soon with the vaccine mandate, that's won't even be an option to. So, but a lot of conservative parents are under the false belief that, well, I'll just talk to my kid when we get home. It's not enough because they're getting indoctrinated how many hours a day. And many times the student isn't even aware of the indoctrination. And, and so, yeah, it's a lot of, they're, they're, you can't, you have to fight the fight. You have to bring it to them because otherwise your kid's going to come home with a whole bunch of values and then. Mm. And pop culture and everything they, you know, they play on their phones, all of that reinforces that now. And, you know, um, I, I don't want to get too existential because, 
you know, we, you and I know how that all plays out in the end. But let's focus it back now on um, talking about the um, interactions with the superintendent, as well as some of the trustees. Um, I think you and I both saw with our um, experiences, you know, with that time when we protested and you spoke in front of the um, uh, the board of trustees uh, building, and then they had moved it to Zoom that day, cowardly. They right. didn't want to face all of the people that were going to come and make public comment, uh, citing COVID concerns, of course. And, and violence, too. Um, oh, yes. They, they, the security thing and and they're, they're, they use the dollar amount to silence people by saying, oh, look, to ensure everybody's safety, it's going to cost us district $35,000. And it's all baloney. Yep, because there was no violence in the end. In the end, there were people from both sides of the debate that peacefully coexisted in the same space. Mm -hmm. And so well, I- It's interesting you say that. It's supposed to be a civic, civil discussion. And when there's- and they don't treat us civilly at all. They keep referring, and, and you know, with the latest blow up with the FU from the professor, you know, I mean, from the president of the Los Angeles School Board, and she just got caught under a hot mic. But the the victim of her, the person she was talking to, had a really great statement, which is, you know, why did it have to take a hot mic, you know, unbeaten, to reveal how they feel about us? Because, and what she really meant is all of us have known how they feel about us this whole time. If, if you've been following, it just took that to become a story. But yes. the story is old news. We get this type of thing. And it's not just her. It's the almost the entire school board. Mm -hmm. And and so they have this attitude towards us that is so transparent that's been going on for, you know, at least the, since I got involved, you know, at the, you know, from the time they silenced us out front, they resent us. They just want, these are school board meetings that just happen to be open to the public. And when the public speaks, all we are are a nuisance to them. And they don't, and I think it all has to do with money. This is speculation, but mm -hmm. I think it, if they're get, getting a whole bunch of money from the federal government, and not so much from the parents, then they- That's where their allegiance is. That's too. their allegiance. And I thought Scott Fayette said the most horrible things during the meeting. Sure, he didn't say two words, but he said a lot more words that were, I think, a lot worse. He just to show the arrogance of these people, mm -hmm. of these school board directors. He said there are a whole bunch of parents who are against the mask mandate, and I could go on for that. You know, it's really scary how much these these kids don't have FaceTime. They get screen time, but no FaceTime because they're wearing masks all day that don't work. And there's tons of studies. And these parents come in with study after study after study showing it doesn't work, including one from the CDC with 90,000 people it took place mm -hmm. in Georgia, 200 schools. I'm sure you know that one. And they found out masks don't work. You know, no statistical significance among a population at 90,000 people. And the, and lady, some other speaker mentioned a study from Singapore and all these different countries. They don't work. So at least, you know, the cloth ones, the ones kids are sneezing into, you know, like, so, yeah, they got to be nasty. So the... The so so in any case, he said some of these parents who are anti-mask, they're having their they pull their kids from the school because of that that's taking away valuable money that should be going to her school district. Very transparent there. And it's all about the money even, for them. Yeah, and he doesn't even he has no hubris, no he's got so much arrogance. He how much did he identify to the parents's he doesn't care about the parents' complaints. It's just about they took money away from me that I'm entitled to. I mean, no business owner could operate like that. Imagine the customer stop coming. You need to come to my store and give me money. Otherwise, I'll go out of business. I mean, this is money quote right there. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, the arrogance is out of control. And we did this because, um, you know, soon after I helped you guys with the Los Alamitos uh, uh, efforts there. Uh, we moved over to Tustin and did a similar town hall. And in Tustin, one of the activists there, uh, activist mommies, she uh, requested a FOIA. And we got all of the communications on email by the principal and, you know, the administrators on ethnic studies curriculum was one of the key words. And we found that uh, one email was so incriminating. It was basically like, oh, these parents don't know any better. We must educate them or, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's amazing the obviously. arrogance as yeah. if our own lived experiences are untrue. 
the, I think it's a form of a gaslighting. Mm. I think they they um, are, are so uh, nefarious in that, that they try to tell us that our experiences and our feelings do not matter. And that is the worst thing you can do. Um, I think no matter what, um, decent people, and I don't care what political spectrum you are, will always empathize and understand what another person has gone through um, with grace and with, you know, the open mind to say, maybe there's not all the information. Um, we don't know all the information. So let's give their lived experience a fair shake. Mm -hmm. That's not even going on with these uh, administrators. They are basically coming in adversarial right away. They, like are. they are zombies. My, you know, I asked my nine-year-old because I was kind of explaining to him what happened during the board meeting. And I want him to look at all sides. I don't just want to just, I want him to be a critical thinker. And so I said, well, you know, the board is in a difficult situation because you got some parents on this side who believe this, and you got some parents on this side who believe that. And, and they're, they could be diametrically opposed. Some people want everybody to wear a mask for safety and some people don't believe it exists and thinks it's harmful. So what, what would you do? And, and my nine-year-old son said, I would put my personal beliefs aside and I would go with the people who had the best argument. I go, wow, okay, mm -hmm. well, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And he goes, you listen, he's nine years old and you figure that. And in mm -hmm. contrast to that, we've got grown adults who've been so radicalized and I think they've been gaslit for a long time. I think mm -hmm. that all that hate against Trump, they now, it's, it wasn't Trump they hated, they hate conservative values. And, and they, they despise even having to, combat mm -hmm. them verbally or have an intellectual conversation mm -hmm. i think a lot of these leftists they could only exist because they're not being challenged and they refuse to be challenged be and they just say well where do you get your news oh i don't i only watch cnn and mm -hmm. I, you know this this mindset was shocking I, I remember during the long beach was having the um the, you know the the riots right or before the riots after floyd and I said to somebody who's very, who gets all their news from CNN and mainstream media. And I said, um, and, and so she said, the people starting all the fires and stuff are white supremacists. They're the ones starting the, the riots. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, actually I got, I, I, before it even happened, I called the police department. And I told them Antifa is coming into Long Beach and they want to start problems. And I had these posters, you know, not posters, but these, these uh, pictures that were professionally designed. And I go, I have the brochures. I could show you the brochures. And the person I talked to goes, well, where do you find those from? I go, Twitter. And she goes, I don't do Twitter. <laughs> so it, it's just like, if, if it's not, they are so self-protected. If it's not in their CNN bubble, right. it doesn't exist. And they won't even look at it. And the school board is the same way. When we go to talk, they already write us off. In fact, before Marilyn Davis or Marilyn Davidson, the president of the school board at Los Alamitos said F you to one of the mothers, a, a, an Asian lady mother who came in, she's so well spoken. She has such great things to say. I believe English is her second language. And it, before she even gets up, I mean, she's a regular speaker. She's very passionate. Um, the uh, Marilyn Davidson or Marlis Davidson says, oh God, here we go again as she's wow. walking to the, the podium. And I got that on hot mic or I heard it. She said real softly, I pumped up the volume so you could hear it. But, it, and, and that, you know, I think it just shows you the disdain they have to even, how could that person even listen if that's what she says before somebody opens mm -hmm. them out? Yeah, the arrogance is just off the charts. And I think it's, uh, you know, they're attached to the structure without really questioning the bottom line, which is the learning for the students. You know, all the things that should be the priorities are not. Um, and they're following rules like radical zombies, not, not even like, oh, passively saying, okay, um, I will follow, but let me be open to um, hearing the parents' experience or the kids' experience. None of that, it's almost authoritarian. They it, are hundred percent, a hundred percent. In fact, at the last board, board meeting, I called the board out on that exact point. That's my whole point, which is I told them my daughter already had COVID. She already has antibodies. She, according to scientific studies in Israel, and again, this is nothing new and they should know all this stuff. This is publicly available information. According to scientific studies, 
from Israel, she now has 15 times more protection and better protection than if she got the quote vaccine. And I hate using that term because that's vaccine is part of the gaslighting. There's no such thing as a vaccine for a virus. It doesn't exist. You don't get the flu vaccine and there's no such thing as a COVID vaccine. It's a COVID shot. And, and that, but the, by, by reading, and the CDC even changed their, the definition of a vaccine. They changed it from something that provides immunity to something that stimulates your body's immune system. So technically a vitamin C is a vaccine too. So going back to my daughter, she has, there's no benefit. And that's, there's another study saying if you got recovered from COVID naturally, there's no benefit of getting the vaccine. Right. So, but there is a risk and that's documented too. There is a risk of getting the COVID shot. So why would you give a 12 year old something that has no benefit to her, but could harm her? Mm -hmm. That is evil. How could anybody give a 12 year old poison or something that could potentially poison her and change her DNA and do a whole bunch of things to her when there's no benefit? Mm -hmm. And the CDC, the FDA, which approved it on five year olds, even said, we won't know the, you know, whether the side effects or the health consequences until after we distribute it. So that doesn't yeah. give me a lot of faith. So, so I'm, I'm asking the board this. And meanwhile, before we even spoke, Scott Fayette and different speakers on the board said, we have no choice in this. This is a mandate coming from the state. And, and so I said, we're not in Nazi Germany. We're in America. You can't cause harm upon a youth and say, I was just following orders. So when you said like, hey, this is turning authoritarian, this is turning to Nazi, I mean, uh, this is turning to zombies. You know, mm -hmm. what you're saying is they're not even thinking. They're just following orders. And they're harming children while doing this. It will harm children. You know, when mm -hmm. you math it out, I, they didn't even prove that it because kids are so low at risk. The FDA didn't even prove that it helps mm -hmm. children because I've said this from the start, Matt, um, a responsible vaccine rollout or whatever you want to call it um, needs to account for contraindications, which is a uh, populations that can be adversely affected yeah. by whatever you're rolling out. So significant testing needs to occur in the past. It took about 10 years to get FDA approval to, you know, to release something. And they were supposed to be very careful about it. But this rush to put this out is um, shocking, unprecedented and dangerous. I mean, we saw that 16 year old girl, I forget, you know, um, granted, she was overweight, but one should know that someone like, um, you know, that's maybe overweight or obese will react more even at a younger age to a shot of COVID basically. So now she is on, uh, last I heard she was um, on life support basically because she's, uh, you know, she reacted so badly to the vaccine. And that's the type of thing that, you know, that um, doesn't get talked about enough. And as a parent, uh, you know, um, I understand that this point of view is maybe 30% of our population. I mean, they've done polls on this. Right. But 30% is still a very significant number. One third of our population has a deep concern. Why is that voice continuously being squashed? It just makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, I feel, so we're, I was at the protest before that school board meeting that went viral. And there's a protest ahead of time against the vaccine mandate. And there were hundreds of cars that honked in support of us that slowed down and went beep, beep, beep. And there, there'd be sometimes five cars at once crossing. Everybody's honking their horns. And, and I, I was still shocked because we are so silenced. And I couldn't believe there are all these people out there. But that's a great question. Why weren't they at the protest? Why were they just honking their horns? Where are the people? And I think people are so scared. It goes back to uh, what Dennis Prager said about he never understood the term to, until just recently, and he was ashamed that it took him so long to learn this. What, you know, there's a term that, you know, about, oh, being a good German. And, I, you know, being Jewish, I've, I've seen a lot of family members kind of use that term when somebody's just following orders. Oh, they're being a good German. So a very derogatory term of somebody just following orders without any ethics. And so he always thought that was just maybe there's something with the German people or I, I, no, I'm, I, he didn't say that, but like, but that, that's kind of like what the term may be. And so he didn't say that, but he didn't understand that term. He just, or the origins. And then he realized what the term really meant 
The Germans were very good people. They were just under a tyrannical government. Right. And the cost of speaking out was so significant that it would be foolish. If you speak out against this tyranny, you now, your wife and your children now don't have income coming in. Right. So what kind of fool would give that all up and, and look at our government, look at our, our people today. If you don't get vaccinated, which could harm you, and, and every shot seems to be worse from what I'm watching. When people are going in for their third dose, they go, oh, that was a real killer. Do you think the fourth dose is going to be better or the fifth dose? I mean, how long is this going to go on? And so if you don't get it in college, you can't go to college or a lot of these colleges. And now in two months, do I, I got to homeschool my kid. Is she going to be working like right here? Like, I have no idea. She's going to be kicked out of school in two months. What the hell? And where are the parents? Yeah. And, and uh, that personal impact to you. So though, so you have a, a daughter and a son, right? So uh, you have two kids and uh, they could potentially in the coming year um, have to be homeschooled. Yes. So that is that a, a well, you know, yeah, and I have no with you and your wife. For that. And, and, you know, and a lot of parents are saying, well, at 12 years old, might as well just get the vaccine. It's just, it's so much easier life. And that's how they do it. Right. You know, it, it's just becomes foolish to say no, because you give up school, you give up this, you give up your friends. I have a friend who got kicked off the club soccer team. She's her whole, I mean, she's young and her whole life is, that's her extracurricular. Now she know no more. And so you lose everything and you can't go out to the restaurants or, you know, mm -hmm. movies if you live in Long Beach or different places and, and, and you lose your freedom. And so, okay, so maybe you do it for your 12 year old, right? You know, maybe, but then, you know, it's really bad for a five year old. Like when do, and now they want to do babies. Like, I mean, this is, I know. Oh, gosh. I mean, and so like, when does it end? And, and that's one way that I, one way to break free of this tyranny is you say, okay, maybe I'm willing to do this, but how far will I go? Mm -hmm. Will I do a five-year-old? Will I do a two-year-old who's not at risk, by the way? Right. And, and, and then you and watch, we will get there. So mm -hmm. you have to, every individual watching this needs to say, how far will I go? And then you might as well stop right now and stand up right now because it's going to be easier to stand up right now than it will be tomorrow. Right. Because it's just getting worse. Just but getting the personal worse. impact to you is, you know, you're willing to have the, the sacrifice of basically um, having your, you know, having your kids homeschooled and, you know, um, uh, basically you're paying your taxpayer dollars. But because the government has become so crazy with these mandates that that um, you have to protect your family because health is the most important thing. It's the only thing we have at the end of the day. So, but the personal impact for you is going to be very large, I'm, I'm assuming. How does that look in your life? And what accommodations do you and your wife have to make to make this happen? Um, yeah, that, you know, I'm, yeah, it's just, it's a little bit emotional because it's a big impact. You know, I'm talking, you know, it's more than, I, I've never been one for homeschooling and I believe in the public schools and I, from a socialization point of view, and my daughter, you know, my mom goes, man, your daughter, she's got her friends there. You're going to pull her away from your fr from her friends. You know, it's a tough time as it is. And, you know, I, I probably I've got other families on the other side, you know, you know, who probably would think I'm a tyrant if I pull my daughter out, you know, like I'm talking about, it's talk, you know, with the in-laws or so. I mean, there, this is so bad and it's so destructive. And, and I just feel like these schools, besides you know, I know they just care about the dollar per unit or the dollar per student. Um, but, the, you know, you look at the ladder of success, you know, whether it's, you know, the join the soccer team, but now imagine wiping a child off of the path. You know, these kids are all clinging on to the only ladder they have a school, and that's their one job. And they're clinging on and they're going up each rung. And then the school board, because nobody has the guts to stand up for what's right, they just wipe all these kids off this, yeah. this ladder. And, and you've got this uh, an Australian politician who took glee. You could see it in her face when she, a reporter asked her. And she's like, yeah, we're creating two, two groups in society, one group that's vaccinated and one group that, that's not. Wow. And, and, and it's just, and who wants to be the, pre I read about some, a couple in Lithuania where they fought so hard to be away from, the, um, from Russia and, and for their independence. And, and then they, 
they both a husband and wife had really good jobs and they both lost their jobs because they didn't get vaccinated and they were doing it for their country. You know, the easy thing for them to do would be to get vaccinated, but they just didn't believe that was right. And now they're not allowed to go grocery shopping. I mean, the future of America is already in other countries. And, and so they can't go grocery shopping. The only place they're allowed to buy food is these overpriced sidewalk places where you, and they don't have a great wow. selection and it's overpriced and limited selection. And they are like, the black sheep of society. I mean, it's it's dystopian. And and are we in that dystopian future in America? Well, maybe in a couple of months we are. I mean, we already are in other regards. But I've got to make plans for my daughter going to school. I'm kind of in denial. I'm just going to wait for it to happen and then figure it out. Maybe that's not the right. smartest thing. But I just I refuse. You're overwhelmed with your happen. regular job, with running a family. There's just too much to be working with hypotheticals i get it but every day it seems like it's getting crazier and towards that dystopia that you talk about it's uh, um you know when i look at the supply chain issue i'm just like wow this is unprecedented we haven't had this in decades right why now right so yeah and the, uh, the solutions are so dumb and that's where we need donald trump because you know he could fix it he could go in and he could fix it and i think our government could fix it too if they wanted to the mm -hmm. you know joe biden says hey let's go uh we're gonna have 24 7 people operating the cranes well the cranes aren't operating during the day <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. not the problem you know there's a different bottleneck and and it's amazing that I think if you go, if somebody would go in there and ask the people what's going on, they would tell you the problems and nobody's listening and nobody's no one's to listening. The problem. And that's kind of the bottom line here, right? Is they're not listening. They refuse to, they, they think that they can just lump, uh, you know, let's say anyone that has conservative views or a Trump voter to be in this bad pile and never listen to them, no matter, um, how loud they're shouting and is saying, I'm, I'm crying for help, how loud they're crying for help. They will ignore that because you're essentially not human anymore if you're lumped in that category, which is very dangerous. I would never do that to my fellow man, whatever uh, political affiliation. We are all people at the end of the day and that humanity is being taken away. But um, let's end on this note, Matt. Um, what are the next efforts you as a parent in the Los Alamitos school district, um, you know, to combat what's going on in the schools and CRT, these vaccine uh, regulations, the overreach and abuse of the administrators and the schools at this point? What is, what are, what is the solution? I know that's probably a very hard question to answer, but what are the next steps and what do you see as uh, productive behaviors for us um, that are fighting alongside with you to engage in to solve the problem? I think we need leadership that reflects the people and that's number one. And so, because realistically nothing's gonna happen while we have the same I'm just fighting the battle locally at the school board because that most affects my life. And I want these uh, school board members to know that they need to take responsibility for their actions. If you look at the Milgram experiment and all these scientific, you know, psychology experiments, you know, the person shocked the person to death during the Milgram experiment. And they had the, the person in the lab coat standing right next to them saying the experiment requires you to continue. And then they, you need to push the buttons. And they push the button. The person shocked to death, you know, is what they believe is happening. And, and the person who was pushing the button is the one who did the shocking. That's our school board. Nobody could force you to harm children. And they are. And, they're, and the Newsom is not going to be the one carrying out the policy. It's our school board. And our school board needs to fight tooth and nail to protect their children. Because if that's not their job, then why would they want that job? That that's tells right. you a lot about that type of person. I, I would never want a job that requires me to harm children. And those are the type of people in power right now. They only care about power. And I think maybe it's because they just, they, they, they think we're all just bad people, so they don't even give our ideas a grain of salt, but we've been telling them the truth, backed up by scientific articles week after week after week at board meeting after board meeting. They have to know we come from a good place. They have to know we don't just go in there and go off the top of our head. We're backing things up as scientific studies, mm -hmm. and they don't listen, and they never will listen until they are removed because they they hate us. They despise us, mm -hmm. and, and we need people to represent us, but we are running out of time. 
there's so many things I want to talk about with like the mask mandate, the importance of FaceTime. We, our faces are organs of emotion. That's how we communicate. There's a feedback loop when people are talking. And if people are like, imagine if this was your whole day in school where you can't see anybody and you can't see them smile, that's torture. And the people making these decisions, I know they're hanging out with people without masks on and they're, for, they're being horrible to these children. That's really important. But I can't even talk about that because my kids can be getting kicked out of school in two months. It's amazing the, the, the frustration you must feel as a parent, but keep on keeping on and let me know what kind of support I can give you. And definitely this is part of that. Um, I'm going to write up an article and really kind of uh, speak to your experience because a lot of people are forgetting that they, they want to make it about political ideology, which is not, it's on the ground, everyday taxpayers, everyday citizens like yourself, that are experiencing the terrible effects and the emotional abuse that is happening to your children as they go into the school that's basically twilight zone. And you and I are so blessed that we lived in a time or grew up in a time where it wasn't this crazy, that we could trust the adults in schools that were teaching us. But I feel so much for your daughter and for your son, what they're going through. They don't even know how much is being robbed from them at this point. So, you know, and I, I want to thank you for because I think if it wasn't for your help and putting to, in in kind of bringing us together and shining the light at this, I I wouldn't even know there's a group of parents that are similar to me. So you really helped galvanize this troop and 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 I was and when I was looking around at the protest and what happened just earlier this week in the Los Angeles School Board District, I don't think this would have happened without your involvement and in helping parents and organize us and lighting that spark and it was actually to me is actually very inspirational that you weren't there you know why it was because you helped start the spark and now the fire is growing and now you could start sparks elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere and what you're doing is god's work and i really appreciate what you're doing oh i super appreciate you for carrying on that because our goal is is to um is to start the spark and let people like you uh, take it the next level because it has to be parents in the district that are uh, leading that fight because every day you're getting those assignments, the weird uh, stuff that's that's coming in from, from the you know framework that has now infected every day into all of the school that, and it effect, infects them differently because like you said, and let me impress this point again, there is that big framework but there are the people who execute it on the ground, whether it's our trustees or it's the um, uh, teachers on the ground. And all of those teachers have the power to not push that button, like you said, to shock the kids. So it's their job too. And I think that is, the, that is God's work right there, reminding them of why they should be called a teacher, why they should be called a trustee. Those were the, the, those job descriptions have gotten so bastardized because now it's all about power, money and benefits or whatever it is, selfish benefit and not what is best for the children. So thank you, Matt. And, uh, you know, we'll be in touch and I'll shoot you the article when it's done. And, you know, thanks for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank Take you care. Too.